Okay. Um, so the title of the talk today is the biennial nation. And um, I was trying to understand what was meant by the title as I prepared this. And so I decided to focus on two main questions, which is how do art biennials and triennials express, expand, and or contest visions of national culture, since this seems to be some a tie that binds many uh, art exhibitions that are going on around the globe. And the second question is how do artists relate to biennials as representations of national interests, which is something that um, I know I have been interested in as an artist, and I also many of my peers have also addressed this, uh, this uh, question, both in their art and sometimes also in their activism. So, uh, you know, given that there's been a lot of attention in the last few years to artist led protests um, that relate to biennials, I, my first question is, are we in the midst of a rise of artist led protests in relation to biennials and triennials? And if so, why is this happening and what are their main, main arguments? Before jumping to that conclusion, I just wanted to remind people with a couple of images here that um, this is not a new phenomenon. Um, I have a photo here of where you see Michelle Wallace and Faith Ringgold in the foreground of the photo from a Whitney Biennial protest in 1970, where they were challenging what they felt were exclusionary curatorial practices of the, of the Whitney Biennial of American art, and then a picture of a protester being dragged out by police from the Venice Biennial in 1968. Uh, and there, uh, the focus of many of the protests was uh, anti-war. Um, what are the main issues, though, that are motivating artist-driven protests uh, against biennials in the present? The first is what are presumed to be exclusionary curatorial practices. So those protests highlight the lack of representation based on gender, ethnicity, or non-European origin. I remember going to Documenta in 1987 when I was a young person and hearing Rolando Peña, the Venezuelan artist, at the press conference uh, criticizing uh, that Documenta for its relative lack of representation of Latin Americans. Um, I know that, that the selections have changed since then, but I uh, always remember that moment and the shockwaves that he caused by raising that at a press conference. Um, uh, the example I put here um, at, from 2019 is from a, a triennial in Japan where there was a mass protest by participating artists um, because of the censorship of an exhibition about comfort women. The artists decided to withdraw their work in protest until uh, the Japanese authorities agreed to allow that show about comfort, comfort women to reopen and then they uh, rejoined uh, the event. Uh, another big issue in the last uh, couple of few years has been the question of patronage or dirty money. Um, so you have a lot of arts professionals subjecting the financing of these events to scrutiny on ethical grounds. Uh, the most recent uh, is that is the was the uh, three month long protest uh, organized by Decolonize This Place um, at the uh, before the Whitney Biennial of 2019 about the uh, board member Warren Canders and his uh, connections to the company Safari Land that was uh, producing weapons and tear gas um, being used in the Gaza Strip against Palestinians, but also there was a contract in the works with the New York Police Department to use the same tear gas. And it was also about uh, the use of that tear gas at the US-Mexico border against uh, parents and children who were trying to cross the border at the time. And then I just wanted to give another example which was the Powell Biennale in 2014 is calling on the BN to reject uh, Israeli funding. And these are just a couple of examples. There are obviously many more. Um, third, this is about artists rejecting the policies of a given nation state. Um, I recall uh, uh, Javier Tellez, the Venezuelan artist and a dear friend of mine, publishing an open letter and resigning from presenting uh, Venezuela in the in pavilion in Venice in Southie because of uh, the policies of Hugo Chavez's government. And uh, Teresa Margoy is in a slightly different move where she didn't reject the position, but she to place her work on the American pavilion instead of inside the Mexican pavilion in protest of the U.S. government's policies against uh, Mexicans and also of uh, U.S. companies' involvement in uh, the gun trade that was 
uh, basically accelerating the drug wars in Mexico. And finally, then there's uh, the artist demands to state control of national culture. And here I bring in the example of Cuba. Um, the first uh, 2018 was the uh, year of the first artist led international exhibition um, to take place in the Cuban Revolution called the Zero Zero Biennial. It was financed through crowdfunding and uh, presented in homes and artist studios. But this was declared um, a crime by the Cuban government as unlawful competition against uh, state interests and participants were harassed Foreign visitors were threatened with expulsion uh, from the country and uh, followed um, and all the events took place with security guards forming kind of circle around them um, as a kind of intimidating uh, presence and uh, since that time this was one of the uh, reasons that uh, uh, artists in Cuba wrote up against the subsequent uh, issuance of Decree 349, which essentially uh, uh, makes independent cultural activity uh, a potential crime uh, in Cuba. And uh, many people were arrested. Some fled the country um, as a result of the harassment and intimidation received for this uh, because of this event. Uh, so I'll move from there to the first question to Carolyn. Um, you organized the first document to take to take place outside of its original national home. To what extent are decentralizing efforts in relation to Documenta a response to the conflicts that were just mentioned and the questions that they raised? Uh, hello, thank you very much for that question, uh, Coco. And um, <clears throat> thank you to the Sharjah, of course, Foundation for organizing this event. Um, first of all, I would like to say that it wasn't me that had the idea of doing such a step, taking such a step of decentralizing the location of the documenta. Actually, I was following on the path of Okwi and Wazor, who <laughs> in his Biennale, uh, Documenta, which is not a Biennale, by the way, it's fundamentally different. Uh, we get subsumed under this thing, but having done the Istanbul Biennale and also the Sydney Biennale, Documenta, which is quinquennial generally, has another pace and another sense of time. So it's less like a serial on Netflix and it's more, um, like a dinosaur of, of exhibition making in the past, previous to the International Biennales. But that said, the documenta prior to mine was uh, uh, Roger Burgo and prior to that was Okwi. And Okwi had already decentralized conceptually the exhibition by creating the platforms, which were basically um, conferences in different parts of the world. And then, uh, the fifth platform was the exhibition in Kassel. So it was um, heightening the discursive question because the exhibition was only the fifth platform and as opposed to the previous four, which were discursive moments. But it wasn't really Okwi's idea either because prior to Okwi, uh, Catherine David, who is with us <laughs> today, uh, in 1997, did the Documenta 10 as the first woman. I was the second and last woman, unless you consider the collaboration that Rugger uh, created, but out of his decision with his partner. Um, uh, uh, so it was actually Catherine. So we're talking about the late 90s. So in the late 90s, Documenta decides, or whoever's dealing with Documenta at the time to think about uh, whether it was a good idea to perhaps decentralize the effort and work. And it is the same time, 97, you know, as after the Istanbul Biennale of 95. And in the 90s, there was a particular chapter to the history of biennials, which had to do with redefining their nature and role and function. And, and uh, so that was just, <laughs> a small detail which didn't give you an answer, but it gave what I think is important, which is a genealogy. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add now as a premise is that 
I really hate, I mean, although I'm very happy to be here today, I really hate online conferences. And the reason I do is connected with the whole issues that we're discussing. Uh, the reason I do is that uh, they, they focus on a mind-body divide, first of all. So suddenly it's our mind that's supposedly speaking. And it, I think they, they cause a kind of a, a psychic disorder, which is that I am not in charge of speaking. I am in Torino and I'm, I haven't listened to all of the other talks in Sharjah of the week. And therefore there's less of a commitment, intellectual commitment in, these, in this moment of talking online. I, I, I did not prepare a written lecture. Uh, I kind of put together some slides. I thought I was supposed to speak 15 minutes, but uh, on my own and then the discussion with, with you would be after, but, but I misunderstood clearly due to my own um, distraction because the problem of the digital is a problem of attack, I think, on the cultural. I mean, at the same, as always, being an Adornian, it is double. You know, on the one hand, it's, uh, it's a system of dissemination and construction of knowledges that uh, allows for gatekeepers to. Uh, open gates, <laughs> and therefore uh, it allows for new aggregations to to build and new and and voices to be heard that were not heard before. Like Black Lives Matter movement benefited very much from the digital, but now uh, there are also spaces that, by separating bodies and separating people, they are also um, causing, I think, uh, less the ability to aggregate and to protest even in, in, in the punctual way that was done in certain biennales in certain moments in certain parts of the world that really has to do with why matter matters and why bodies matter. So uh, those were two premises. And for my case in particular, to answer your question, uh, it comes from Obviously, it comes obviously in, 2000, in, in the early, two, in the mid 2000s, uh, on top of many, many other projects, the Pantagruel syndrome and uh, the, the European capital of culture in 91 that I had organized, curated one of the major projects in Antwerp, comes out of thinking about the crisis of Eurocentricism. I mean, I'm saying uh, uh, quite obvious things, but at the same time, I also believe that the digital age has canceled out and that's why I really appreciate what you did with the photographs of Venice Biennale and of other earlier things, has canceled out and deleted the incredible internationalism that was present in the late 60s and 70s um, uh, in, in many events it, that occurred in Europe. And if you look at participation, for example, of artists from India and artists from other parts of the world, there were moments in the documenta past where uh, that was not a subject matter. It wasn't uh, like top, topical, topicized, but it was actually occurring much more than in the 80s and 90s um, until very recently. So in my particular case, uh, it came obviously out of a sense of embarrassment for dealing with this major exhibition uh, in the heart of Europe without, uh, well, with what I thought was an aporia, a kind of a contradiction, you know, of bringing the world to castle and yet the structure of the exhibition was not changed. So because of this contradiction between again, form and content, body and matter, the, I always see these splits. I decided to shift the whole uh, exhibition itself onto positions that artists take when they act. The position of being in a state of siege, the position of being in a state of hope, the position of retreating. Morandi who retreats in the middle of fascism in Italy and paints bottles in a small room. And the last was the position of, uh, well, uh, hope, stage, siege and retreat. And it seemed to me uh, more 
uh, let's say productive to to work with a certain stages, let's call for these positions that were not necessarily castle, although castle was itself in a state of um, hope and siege in 1948 when Documenta had started after World War II. So uh, that brought me to the idea of working in Afghanistan in Kabul because of a kind of a uh, overlap of different times the time of 1948-1955, where you are occupied, occupied by your liberators after a dictatorship, and the time of uh, post-Taliban in Afghanistan, where you were occupied by your liberators, uh, it, 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 Italian army, German army, so forth, armies, uh, and, and, and how those two places in particular, because then there were projects done in Banff in Canada, on the theme of retreat and subject of retreat, uh, also with indigenous artist uh, Brian Jung and retreated to the, the position of Banff. But that it would take like two hours to tell you the whole story. But I, just to summarize and answer, um, so let's set aside for a minute what, what was Cairo, which was basically just a, a conference and a meeting for some days, and Banff, which was a retreat. <laughs> And, and I generally focus on Castle in Kabul when I talk about this question. So uh, two places that had to uh, reconstruct some sort of a country after a war and yet could not reconstruct it on very dangerous premises that are normally used for nation building. So nationalism in Germany at post second world war or uh, for example, uh, being an Islamic nation in uh, 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 in, in, in Afghanistan uh, after the problem of the extremism in, with the Taliban period. So many discussions went on, both with artists uh, from there and not from there, uh, with Ashraf Ghani, who at the time was, was uh, just a person in, in Kabul. He wasn't yet the politician that we know now. Uh, his daughter, Mariam Ghani, and, and uh, uh, many of the Afghan diaspora, and also with artists in, from all over the world who were against and for, because the problem there was how to avoid um, a kind of colonization of the space of exhibition with a German-led exhibition happening there. So that became the question that, that, uh, that we worked on through workshops and, and so forth. Uh, and exhibition making, and it led to bringing <clears throat> to Castle also very much of what had been done in Kabul. But uh, I don't know if that answered your question. I think you asked me what I think now, not what what I thought then. Is that what you, what what you uh, asked? I, me? I mean, I think it's. I think the question is open to interpretation. I just need to um, very gently remind you that we have to start winding up to yes. move on to the next presentation yes. in the next yes. minutes. Okay, okay. so uh, um, I have no point in pulling out a PowerPoint, I guess, at this point. Um, Coco, I think the problem right now is so much more complex than it one was then. That's the point, because the problem now is intersected with the question of digital and the digital power. And we all know what's going on with the, with the whole NFTs and, and what's going on. And, and so I think that uh, to reinvent or to, I, I really believe in Biennales, let's put it this way. I think that it is very important to not uh, break down this thing, which started at some point for many different reasons and which today could be a kind of counterbalance with a certain kind of digital globalization, which I find very preoccupying and, and very worrying. And I remind everyone that Zoom is, belongs to a private company that, that we're on. So everything we're producing is words that belong contractually to this company. Thank you. Carolyn, and I apologize for having given the impression that I was blocking your PowerPoint presentation. So I've no, no, removed no. my uh, slide. 
Yeah, I, I will. Uh, I will just put up my next slide because I want to make sure that everybody watching understands the question and also have it there for the translators briefly. Then I'll pull it off and um, and uh, and if uh, Catherine, you have uh, something that you want to show, please go ahead and do so. Okay. Okay. So uh, the question for Catherine is. Current debates in France about the supposed rise of Islamo leftism, which is understood to be a fusion of religious radicalism and leftist thought. Oh, I'm getting a sign here that's it's unstable. Okay, reveal deep anxieties that link the growth of post colonial populations with the end of a universalist definition of French national culture and identity. Post colonial and anti racist views of France are thus equated with the collapse of laicite. Should cultural policies and practices sponsored by the French government be mobilized to promote a multiculturalist view of France? So, first of all, I would like to say good afternoon and thanks a lot to all or or Sharjah uh, uh, March meetings friends. Even so, you know, for the twentieth birthday, even so, we are celebrating from far. Um, the question is very precise, so I'm not uh, reading a paper. I'm trying to answer as honestly as possible to your question. And uh, first of all, I would like to do what uh, uh, us as intellectuals should do these days even more than uh, usual, to clean up a little bit, uh, very, very spoiled territories. So coming back to uh, meaning, coming, coming back to uh, the meaning of words. So first of all, I think that uh, laicite, in, which is secular in English, and I know that uh, linguist, and I'm not, uh, it's not my field enough in order to interfere on that, but it's not exactly the same uh, meaning, secular and laicity, but we should always remember, and uh, beginning by French people, they should remember that laicity doesn't mean in any way, and you, I read the, the law again, doesn't mean in any way against any religion. It just means anyone can practice any religion he wants as soon as it stays as a private exercise and commitment. So, you know, this whole idea that laicite is, you can be absolutely uh, uh, a believer, which I'm not, I'm really a very, very uh, fierce <laughs> secular person, but uh, there is nothing uh, telling that you are not allowed to be a very um, deep uh, believer. This is one thing. Uh, the second, which is even more uh, problematical these days, is the kind of gulbi gulba, you know, the mishmash of this uh, Islamogoshism story, uh, which is a very, very nasty uh, development. All, uh, it's a kind of a war machine organized by the, uh, not, not even unfortunately the right wing, uh, organized by the right wing, of course, but also um, big sections of the French government at the moment and which is built against gender, post-colonial and inter intersectionality studies. This is what it has been devised for. The main, the big problem with that is that when you are a little bit, uh, when you remember, when you have a minimum knowledge of the uh, past 50 years, even more if uh, it's preferable, you will know that Islamogoshism has a certain meaning and not necessarily pejorative, you know. You, if we want to expose the old uh, historical background, you have for speaking fast three moments. The first moment, which is the political Islam or the political Islams of the 20s and 30s, when uh, people were articulating religious uh, uh, beliefs, commitments, and a, pro a, pro a program of emancipation. This would go for Copti, Albana, and many others. So this is the first moment. Second moment, which is of course more related to what is debated today, but very, very, um, uh, not understood by many people, which is the islamo progressist moment of the 60s and 70s, you know, and it goes for certain Palestinian groups, it goes for uh, the beginnings of the uh, Iranian revolution, it goes as far as the first moment, the first moment of Michel Foucault writing on Iranian revolution. So, you know, this, this means that it has nothing to do with gender, it has nothing to do uh, with uh, uh, intersectionality, it has to do with a very, very complex articulation of 
a religion, prog progress and process of emancipation, a discourse and groups of people. And this is something which has been uh, uh, worked out enough uh, so that you could really be free of the uh, kind of soup, very, very reactionary soup we have at the moment. I could mention, because a friend just sent it to me a little bit late, unfortunately, a wonderful uh, um, interview by one of the most uh, interesting, important, challenging, committed, and honest um, politologist and Islamolo Islamologist we have in France with, with Olivier Roy. So I think that uh, we, we can't mix everything. You know? So Islamogoshism is something, and the way it is used now is absolutely uh, irrelevant. It's, uh, it would be ridiculous if it was not so dangerous, mixing all the levels and creating a very uh, unnecessary um, in polemics, you know, when the issue is more about a, a more decent representation of uh, many different uh, parts of French society, many, many different, I would prefer to speak in terms of different parts of society, you know, I don't believe so much in groups as such, and I'm very, very anxious about a kind of uh, recrudescence, you know, of a, a neo essentialization uh, neo um, assignations, you know, to be, uh, it's, it's fitting too well with uh, neoliberal liberal agendas. So as, a, as, a, as an intellectual, as a um, cultural uh, operator, I would try to be as open as possible to um, the plurality of the expressions, uh, the complexity of the uh, um, material expressions of the uh, amenities of today, I would be very attentive. And I think these days, it's maybe something which could connect with uh, a few comments made by uh, Chris, uh, by uh, Caroline <laughs> previously. I think we should be very attentive to new formats. So when I'm saying that, I'm not saying I'm against Biennale, I'm against uh, any, uh, we don't do any um, body and, uh, body and flesh real exhibitions, but I think we have to be attentive to the um, new formats who are uh, able and to a certain extent forced to invent these days. And I've been very attentive this last year, where well, I've been like you, <laughs> a lot at home, a lot online, a lot looking at things coming from very different groups of people, very different parts of the world. Uh, I've been very attentive to uh, new, uh, new editings, new formats, new ways of articulating uh, images, representations, discourses, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think that, you know, these days, as uh, I'm um, as uh, anxious about the, uh, until a certain extent, the moment we are living in is in a way, forcing us to be anxious about that, forcing us to be more uh, vigilant and uh, more reactive to uh, what uh, I would consider, and it's not new, as uh, some people would say, ah, la, 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 it, she's back with her uh, 1970, 90, 97, 97 um, uh, blah, blah. Uh, I'm very anxious about the um, growing uh, instrumentalization and uh, gadgetization of uh, art practices, you know, I really believe that these days we have to be very careful. Culture is culture, art is something different. And I would uh, remind uh, this very, very, is never very, is always brutal, but <laughs> very often meaningful. So the statement by Jean-Luc Godard, long time ago, the culture is the rule and the art is the exception. And I think we should really be uh, more attentive to this uh, aspect of uh, the potentials of a contemporary creation. And we should be really um, um, aware to um, not falling into uh, re-categorization, re-essentialization, re-assignations uh, to uh, which are in a way um, back to a certain idea of identity, which is absolutely, from my point of view at least, uh, conservative for not seeing reactionary, which is the, you know, the, what is given, what is there, uh, what is uh, till a certain extent close. So of course, I'm much more interested in a Derridian, in a Maran, as he would say, idea Derrida had on identity. I think I would put it in a, um, probably more brutally and uh, less intelligently than he did, but I would put it as a, 
you know, to be more and more attentive of the, uh, to the um, opening to the complexity of the possible processes of identification. And, you know, as soon as I hear identity, I'm really, really um, a little bit um, anxious. And I think that the, the, the if there's, we should really uh, be um, uh, very, um, to take time, so when I was speaking about new formats, I was also uh, meaning to be much more attentive to very different rhythms, to be very attentive to different speeds, high and low speed, if there's, and uh, to be, um, how to do that, you know, uh, to pay attention to the um, processes to the you know what's really happening to be more uh, to look more carefully to to works and not being uh, anxious about uh, um, production and you know this kind of a, a cultural um, massive event which is uh, in a way a less and le le more and more acting as a against, at the end of the day, against uh, the potentials of a really, what I would consider as a subversive, emancipatory, uh, aesthetical uh, proposals. So, you know, I think these last months, of course, it was not so fun for many of us, but at least uh, if you were uh, patient enough, uh, committed enough, um, courageous enough, because sometimes it was hard, you had many opportunities to um, pay attention to these uh, complexities, to these um, micro and uh, micro um, resistances which are at work in the ethical process. So in a way to be more modest and um, you know, less grandiose and at the same time on another level, of course, more ambitious with what we are doing. So as you said, 10 minutes, you know, I'm always trying to respect because I know it's hell to be the one thing you, you stop, but this is more or less my way of uh, answering. And of course, my final, I, I could have begin, I could have begun with that, but you know, I didn't want to be provocative unnecessarily. I could have begun with that, but I will end with saying, please no, surely no to the French authorities. I don't think the French authorities, even less these days, are the one able to take the lead and even less responsibility in order to uh, open, the, um, open the frame, open the space to um, complex expressions. We would like to see more obviously uh, present on the scene. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much, Catherine. I guess we can come back in the discussion. Well, I, if I understand what you finished saying that you don't think that the government can or should be promoting a multiculturalist view. I, I say, I ask this as somebody who has worked in many parts of Europe and other post-colonial populations in the arts in other European countries are always talking about how France's views of itself prevent there from being a cultural debate within the arts about uh, racism and uh, multiculturalism. That's why I was posing the question, but we can save that dis for the discussion oh, after everybody gets to speak. Yeah. Putting an artist, a wonderful singer who passed away last year, Rashid Taha, when he was saying, Alger um, in French it's nicer, Algerian tous les jours, et français pour toujours, Algerian every day, and French forever. Now, for me, it says much more than uh, many uh, pseudo political discussions of these days in France. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we can go on to Octavio. Okay, just give me one second to put this up. Okay, so the question for Octavio is, uh, since the early 1990s, when Cuba lost Soviet subsidy, the Havana Biennial has become financially dependent on foreign capital, primarily from Europe. At the same time, the Cuban government has extended international participation in that biennial to include post-colonial populations and American minorities. However, the government still enforces strict limits, both ideological and territorial, on Cuban participation. It treated the first independent effort by Cuban artists to create their own biennial as a lawful competition with the state's venture. 
So the question then is how can external bodies that support Cuban art promote respect for ideological diversity within the nation? And I'll remove this uh, so that Octavio can put up whatever images he would like. Octavio, you're you, muted. You need to unmute can you, the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good morning. Good 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 afternoon. Uh, I'm I'm speaking from Boston. Um, and first of all, I would like to to thank the, the Sarja Foundation, and particularly uh, Hura Kosimi, um, Salah Hassan for this incredible invitation. I also feel particularly privileged to be around these remarkable women that have been selected for this panel. Uh, um, also, I would like to thank three people that have helped me and have helped all of us in putting this panel together that are Wasan Yusif, Sana Abdumajil and Ali Alamri. Uh, having said that, I will I, I should say that uh, I shouldn't really address any specificity related to the Havana Biennial since I haven't participated directly in Havana except through panel discussions and the publication of two catalogs uh, for the Biennial with my brother Antonio through the Central Atlantico in Canary Islands and Atlantica, the journal for which I worked for 27 years. However, what you mentioned um, and the question and comments that you are uh, addressing to me uh, doesn't escape me. Uh, first, as far as I can tell, European institutions, foundations and others from Latin America are sources that have helped the biennial to continue. Regarding the international participation, and particularly that of African and Latin American artists, I believe it was already in place since the beginning of the biennial in the 80s. And it is true that in some cases, and Tania Bugera immediately comes to mind, some interventions were closed or censored during these past years. On the other hand, in a Marxist country that has been forced to exist only with the help uh, of a few friends for so many years, and that it has in her territory the unlawful presence of her main enemy. Unfortunately, the, its existence and preservation has taken at time a very dramatic turn that has no help anyone. But I cannot go further than, further than that. My personal experience has been with a new chapter of the Habana Biennial in Matanzas, an entity conceived and directed by Maria Magdalena Campos Pons with the curatorial contributions of Salah Hassan, Selen Wen, and myself. In this case, Maria Magdalena Campos wanted to celebrate the city as a beacon of cultural development, decentralize the attention and monopoly of Havana, and instead of perpetuating the cultural oblivion of her city of birth, once known as the Athens of Cuba, bypass uh, once and again by the link between Havana and Varadero, she wanted to show the potential and idiosyncrasies of Matanza his historic place in the slavery trade through the Atlantic to heal the forgetfulness of the past and show the renovated, renovated spirit of the city. The Biennial brought together some, in Matanzas brought together some 80 artists, more than 30 from, from there, from, from Matanzas itself. I need to mention Adrian Socorro, Adversary Alonso, Adrian Riera, Claudia Padrón, Ernesto Millán, Ernesto Cruz, Enrique Casas, Jorge Salomón, Leslie Loyola, Ramón Pacheco, Agustín Drake, Uriel García, 
even though I know that I'm forgetting others equally remarkable. Uh, at the same time that I'm talking, I'm showing some of the of the pictures uh, of these uh, artists. And also I should mention uh, in international artists, uh, among the international artists participating, I should mention Julie Meretu, Melvin Edwards, Carry My Wings, Olu Ogive, and Bryn Bad, Ana Maria Velasco, Cosmo White, Iktikar, Dari, and Elizabeth Dari, Lisa Wall, Evelyn Reese, and Guillermo Galindo. In any case, none of the artists was there representing any country but themselves. Although the Biennial didn't have many resources to produce new works, deal with the transportation of works and the accommodation of so many artists, many European galleries and some institutions and North American galleries, friends and colleagues helped with expenses. Also, the Biennial benefited from the celebration of the 325th anniversary of the foundation of Matanzas. Many buildings were restored and conditioned. Several of them were specifically designated for the biennial use and future cultural or, art or artistic endeavors. The government of the city collaborated since day one and provided all the help that was needed to make it a popular event with the participation of the whole city. Maria Magdalena Campos Pons herself spent a little fortune of her own to make sure of the success of the biennial. Teachers such as uh, Daniel Alvarez and government officials like Luis Octavio Hernandez and Carlos Torrent should have also been mentioned in the organization and logistic of the event. As a whole, the biennial contributed to the ongoing development of the city and attended many of the needs of the artistic community. The work is not done though. Paraphrasing Tirjan Solgar in his intervention of yesterday, Rios Intermittentes, the Havana Biennial in Matanzas, focus on the important things for the artistic community of Matanzas and the needs of his people, access to international exposure and infrastructural needs the interesting things could come at a, uh, at a later time. The important things were covered from my point of view. Finally, in relation to the promotion of influential pressure of external supporters for ideological diversity in the country, I honestly believe that people should be liberated, shouldn't be liberated by external agents, but by themselves. Of course, we have a responsibility to help for the betterment of social and political conditions of a, of a given country that in the case of Cuba, we, we particularly visit very often. But I'm not thinking just about Cuba. Primarily, I'm thinking of the North American and European racism and Islamophobia and the imperial policies and devastation caused by both political and economic influential areas. And this is the end of my presentation. Maybe later I will be able to answer whatever question you may have for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Octavio. Yeah, I was thinking more in my question of what happened in 2003 after the arrest of 75 Cuban intellectuals, several uh, European foundations such as the Evos and Prince Klaus did withdraw uh, support for the biennial and began instead to give support directly to independent artists and journalists um, as a way of expressing their um, disagreement with uh, state policy in that particular instance. But we can continue this uh, later. Um, yes. I've been asked to reverse that the, the order of things um, and not put my slide up first. So I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, because I, I did send everybody their questions uh, beforehand, but uh, so we will uh, move on to uh, Bongi. And uh, so Bongi, did you have a presentation, a slide presentation that you wanna share? 
Bongi, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, I am. No, I did. I did not have Coco. I thought it would be easier to speak of the calf <laughs> since the Johannesburg Biennale was an off the calf kind of happening. The both the two times that it happened, so it's easier to talk of the calf because the question that you posed of uh, uh, the 1995 Johannesburg Biennale, or we called it the Biennale because we're copying Venice. <laughs> I know it's, by, it's a biennial. So, but we, we picked up the, 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 the language uh, of the Biennale. Uh, so um, your question that relates to uh, the fact that the that this biennial happened only twice relates directly to uh, how it started. It started as a reaction to um, the end of apartheid. The planning uh, started in 1992 with the, the, the director of the city of Johannesburg, uh, Arts and Culture, Christopher Thiel, and Lorna Ferguson, and then a whole lot of us joined in. But it was as a, um, a celebration of uh, South Africa through the Johannesburg city coming back into the fold uh, after almost um, uh, more than 40 years of cultural isolation. The biennial correctly marked a watershed moment for South Africa's uh, South African artists, but also uh, the, the, the going into the, the, the these international exhibitions that a number of artists had participated in uh, much earlier before the, the cultural uh, boycott. Uh, the, a number of artists that had uh, participated in the in the uh, Sao Paulo Biennale and the uh, other artists that participated, participated in Venice. Uh, but after the cultural isolation, there was this complete depth of uh, relationships by artists with international artists. Uh, it opened the country, but it also opened opportunities for visual artists in particular, even though with the first Biennale, there was a number of other um, activities that were around. We, 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 there were a, a number of cultural activities that uh, uh, were, were linked to the, the happening of the, of the Biennale at the time. Marking as it did the entry of South African uh, cultural activities into the entire world. And it became uh, what uh, the late David Kolwane says was almost like a, uh, a safari. And people came to South Africa for a safari of art, going to see artists in different parts of uh, the country in order to uh, uh, co-curate, Octavio co-curated with, uh, with uh, Dumelo Musaka. Uh, this for me uh, sort of relates to your, the last question, if it were, how might that be beneficial to South, South African artists? The, the in first biennial had a group recognizing the fact that there was no uh, curatorial uh, studies in South Africa at the time. It brought in a, a 13 um, young artists that wanted to see what curatorial work was all about. And they were matched with the international curators. But <laughs> this is what um, David Polwane uh, very wisely said. It was almost like, um, not, not recolonizing, but it was seen as a recolonization by the international uh, uh, 
art um, curators that came into the country. But for us who are in the visual art, art section sector, it, it was a watershed moment and it opened up so many um, opportunities. Uh, I asked my daughter who is 40, uh, 20, uh, uh, 40 this month, uh, actually tomorrow, uh, because she came to the she came to my to the exhibitions and to the Johannesburg Biennale, and she could actually talk about the difference between the first Johannesburg Biennial and the second one that uh, uh, Okwe had put together, uh, Trade Routes, uh, History and Geography, as uh, not as a, um, a pavilions of kind of na national pavilions. It was artists, as Octavio was saying, artists for themselves it, within the curated uh, six curated exhibitions that happened in uh, the 1997 uh, biennial. And it didn't only happen in Johannesburg. It uh, uh, happened in Cape Town, in two venues in Cape Town and four venues in Johannesburg, which then was almost a um, confirmation that the country has had come into uh, its own in terms of visual, of the visual arts. But unfortunately, uh, the, the, gov the, the government, the new government, I don't think it, it, it grappled with the realities of what this was about. And this is why, while it was a South African biennial, it was a Johannesburg city project. And uh, when the city didn't have funding, it, the, co the collapse was that easy after uh, the 1997 biennial which was threatened a number of times with closure during its run because uh, the politician didn't see how so much money should be spent on pictures. That's how they saw it. So the question of should it be revived, um, I, I'm not sure whether it, the revival of a biennial as, as a concept is going to change anything in terms of um, the moment that we find ourselves in as uh, the South African uh, visual arts uh, community. But because of opening up, a number of things have happened uh, uh, that, are, that are directly based on those two momentous events. The, the 95 and the 97 Biennales, in that we are able to talk about uh, young curators that came out of that, that are now uh, international names and we count out of them, uh, uh, Clive Kellner um, and uh, obviously uh, Dumelo Musaka, Uh, Bongi seems to have frozen at my end. I don't know if anybody else is having difficulty hearing her. Frozen. Oh, Bongi, can you Hi. hear us now? I can, I can, I can, uh, okay, but I can't you see. You, when you were listing uh, people like Toomey and Clive, after that yes. you froze. So you, if you could oh. just go back, okay. Are you there? Uh, it appears that we may have lost a connection with Bangi. Um, 
I don't know. I, my my uh, inclination would be to move on and then come back when Bongi can reconnect with us. I hope that's okay. Um, so uh, let's uh, move on to uh, Gabby's presentation. And uh, and then when Bongi is able to reconnect, we can come back to her after your presentation. Okay, Gabby? And I'm going to uh, not put the question up in case you want to put your slides up and I can put my question up at the end, if you like. Um, yeah, I think it would be yeah maybe important to 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 for people to know which questions I'm responding to. Although I won't be Should so direct in in the you, you want me to just throw them up for a second? Should I just throw them up for a second and then take it away? You can read it, or I can read it. Uh, okay, I'll read it. Oops, sorry. Hold on. Okay, in an interview about the Berlin Biennale published in Artnet in 2018, you discussed the pressures and expectations on you as the event's first African curator. It was presumed that your team would, quote, solve the problem of Europe, so to speak. The biennial's title, we don't need another hero feels like a refutation of that demand. In the aftermath of that experience, do you think that curatorial arguments or artistic works should be conceived of as disruptions of received notions of European identity? What are the advantages or disadvantages of looking at culture this way? Thank you. Um, thank you for your question, uh, Coco, and thank you to the, the Shaja Biennale team, um, everyone who's been involved in making this event uh, a success, and, and also thank you to, to my fellow panelists uh, for laying the ground. Um, um, I, I, I want to <laughs> respond to that question um, directly, um, but I, I, I I have a few slides, there are very few, there are about four. Um, I just want to maybe address the question of, uh, of, of connecting um, um, the, the article that you quote to, to, um, to the title of, of the Biennale, which is uh, We Don't Need Another Hero. I think uh, for us, uh, um, this title was more um, towards the idea, it was many things, um, many layers, um, but more importantly, like the distribution of, uh, of responsibility. Um, and uh, in, a, in another um, interview, uh, I think it's in the Gutier Institute uh, 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 publication online, um, I'm quoted as saying, we are all post-colonial. And I think uh, that is uh, um, what has been was was in, important for us to distribute this responsibility and not to to kind of uh, um, um, to be perceived as 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 coming in yes to solve um, those problems but rather uh, to 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 work together um, in, 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 and to find kind of like solutions um, and also not to um, yeah, to take a, a position of, 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 of not always explaining um, or a position of not always having to respond to the West's misconceptions of us, um, which, uh, which also can be ex exhausting. But it was also to lay a ground um, uh, where we can, you know, go directly into, into the work that we were uh, supposed to do rather than um, um, first to deal with the uh, uh, problems that we did not uh, uh, create. Um, because I, I, think, uh, I think the question that a lot of uh, media were, were, were asking, if I just rephrase, was how have we dealt with the problem of being a problem? Um, and, and, and so the image that I have here is a, is a, is a an image from a public program that we started a year before the opening um, and which we decided to, 
to, to collaborate with the uh, uh, library and the space uh, in Vedding in Berlin, which is called Each One Teach One, uh, run by uh, uh, predominantly uh, Afro, Afro, Afro German uh, people, people, Germans who live in, 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 in Berlin, um, who happen to have to, to, to have a, a African um, uh, identity as well. Um, and, and what strikes us about the, 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 the library and, the, and this project, Each One Teach One, um, was of course the books, uh, which is, you know, the library. And so uh, myself and my curatorial team, we, we selected about 300 uh, titles of, of these books and, and made them into a kind of a video slide projection for this event. Um, and in, 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 in that way, we also wanted to lay a ground and to, 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 to not always start from the beginning um, because we always uh, expected to start from um, whatever perceived beginning uh, uh, that people have of us, but to, to acknowledge the work uh, that has been done by so many people over hundreds of years, which is documented also in these books, um, and, uh, and, and to, 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 to cover space where we can move the discussion forward, uh, rather than always starting from, uh, from the same uh, position. Um, so the, the, the performance of uh, Donna Kukama, who's a South African artist, took place in the library itself, um, as the whole event did, but uh, her performance was in the library space where the books are kept, um, and which was titled The Not Not Educational Spirit. So also like this kind of like double negation, it was to, um, yeah, also to, to, to say because, you know, the notion I mean, I think education, of course, is important, um, but also there's a, well, there was a kind of notion that we would come in to, to explain and to educate people about how to, 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 to deal with certain questions that relate to us. And, and our point was that these questions relate to the whole entire world. Uh, and it's not one particular subjectivity or certain subjectivities that are tasked uh, with, with addressing certain questions. Uh, it's a, a, so in 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 yeah in that way uh, postcolonialism the world is postcolonial. Um, um, so one of the the things that we 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 did in Berlin this is a, a project by a Brazilian artist Cynthia Marcel um, is also to to look also at, at institutions and, and their history and to take interest in in the histories of these institutions uh, in an international city such as Berlin uh, and to, 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 to make a portrait. This is a portrait of the institution of, uh, um, of Berlin Biennale or, or KW Kunstwerke uh, institution um, after 20 years of its, of, of its existence. Um, so, so what Cynthia uh, basically did is create a meeting, um, a brainstorming meeting with a lot of people that were, were, were involved in, 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 in the beginning of this institution. And, and from these meetings, um, those people would identify the, the legendaries of the institution. And by legendaries, they didn't mean that the most important people necessarily uh, of the institution, um, but also yeah, people who might not be on the forefront of the institution, uh, people who have been working in management or uh, in, in maintenance, um, and so this uh, this became the portrait of uh, of the institution. It's an ongoing project uh, by Cynthia Marcel, where she makes these portraits of, of different institutions. Uh, so far, most of them, four of them, have happened in Berlin, but it's an ongoing project which she 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 aims to have at least fourteen um, of these portraits in different parts. Uh, of the world, and and um, and a, a, another strategy for the 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 um, for the tenth Berlin Biennale was, of course, to the collaboration with institutions. And I, and I think also this was very really important because Academie der Kunst is one of the the, the oldest institutions in Europe um, with vast archives in in different uh, fields, uh, uh, cinema, film. Um, theater, 
visual arts, uh, etc. And we were trying to imagine, of course, the, the, the archive is vast and, and nobody can, uh, no one person can know uh, its entirety. Um, but we were, uh, for example, looking for, for traces in the archive in an institution that is more than 200 years old um, of, uh, of, uh, of a particular event that is, uh, um, I think that was really important for the world, which was the Haitian uh, revolution. And, and, and because when Academy of the Kunz uh, existed, the revolution um, happened whilst Academy of the Kunz existed as an institution. And, uh, and, and, uh, and we did not find anything related to this event, um, which of course, uh, um, you know, um, uh, makes visible um, certain silenced histories and especially this one in particular. So the intervention in front of, of the Academy of Kunz of Firale Baez um, was, became quite an important uh, kind of uh, uh, work or intervention um, and, and to kind of meet the archive in, in a, in a, in a um, um, to, 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 to insert perhaps uh, these histories, but also to, to realize that they are, um, they are in ruins, um, these stories, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, and, and thinking about, you know, for example, the, the San Sosu in Berlin, post Dharma, and, and the one in Haiti, in the northern of Haiti, and also the man who was uh, involved in this uh, revolution um, in, back in, in Haiti. Um, that also had the same name. So there's uh, three kind of uh, entry points, uh, entry points to, to, to those histories. So if you came to one, one particular side of, uh, uh, of Academy of the Kunz, you would um, walk in um, into, through, through this, uh, the, one of these doors. I mean, the idea of course was to put it right in front uh, of Academy of the Kunz, um, but this was, uh, um, not that it wasn't possible, but it wasn't allowed, so to speak, uh, because the academy is a, is a, is a, is a, um, an, an, an institution, um, heritage institution. So we had a lot of dances also with, uh, with people who take care of heritage in the city of Berlin. And it, in those conversations themselves were, were quite interesting. Um, you know, to kind of dance and, and have these conversations about what can be uh, blocked, what can be touched and what is untouchable. Um, and this is my last uh, slide, which, you know, when I saw Christopher Cousier during our research trip to, to uh, six islands in the, in the, in the Caribbean, um, this was in the Cayman Islands where there was a conference tilting axis. Uh, where Christopher Cozier was presenting. Um, and I thought this was uh, quite a, uh, an interesting image in terms of like how we were thinking about this. So um, the idea of not needing another hero um, and, 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 uh, and, and to kind of like work uh, across and, and for everybody to have um, uh, their say, uh, you know, because we're working in a space of Europe where people are literate uh, and a lot of this information actually is translated into into many languages, including German. Um, and 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 for us to to be able to move forward with with our thinking without always going back to to explain. Tony Morrison uh, did say that you know um, these type of situations they 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 actually uh, are, are, are painful in that they they are, um, we they they waste our time. Um, so we were trying to kind of like preserve that time and to try and move and dislodge the conversations uh, from this kind of loop um, in order to, to, to see how we can uh, uh, move forward. Um, and uh, your question, I think um, you say, In the aftermath of the experience, do I think curatorial arguments or artistic work should be conceived of as disruptions of uh, received notions of European identity? What are that value? Well, I think I've answered that question um, um, in, 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 in a sense, and I think it would be a shame to be always uh, an <laughs> artist 
having to 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 respond um, to to these misconceptions about their own identity. I think it, it was Clisant who said, "As far as my identity is concerned, I will take care of it myself." Thank you. Thank you, Gabi. Um, Carolyn, would you like to share your PowerPoint? Um, we have time now for you to share what you were not able to um, present at the beginning. Due to my error, I apologize again. Would you like to sh share the PowerPoint you had? Hello? Yes, hi. Would you like to share the PowerPoint that you had that I, on, ah, I on, uh, by mistake? No, it's I probably my, uh, okay, first, of course, thank you. Probably it's my uh, confusion, my not having understood the instructions of the the event. That's all. So I'm sure that it's uh, probably my mistake. Anyway, the PowerPoint, um, well, if you want, uh, uh, let me share please this. Please go thing. ahead. No. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, here we are sharing the screen. I'm just very quickly, uh, it went through thinking about the birth of the periodic exhibition uh, coming out of uh, coming out of a war and and how that functioned and then what I told you about the positions uh, they had different dates and different times and this was the concept uh, in a way that uh, was being investigated and how the different places related and connected with what was going on with Castle and um, the subject of the documenta was not uh, the structure of the Biennales at all. So it was more an investigation into the questions of collapse and recovery through uh, b both in terms of war and trauma and in terms of also the environment. And um, that's why we were working on, on the various levels together. This was the team that did the whole thing. Um, there were artists and curators on the team, you know, ranging from, well, you can see Pierre Huig there and Sofia Hernandez and Koyo Kuo and um, the end and then Rene Gabri. Uh, I, I, I wanted to speak to you about materiality and how materials are embedded with um, historical trauma. This is from travels and research during the documenta. This was in the Beirut Museum, of course, the melted uh, Roman artifacts and in the Bamiyan Valley where the Bamiyan Buddhas were uh, destroyed uh, with a number of artists. And um, the, in, in the north of the world, in the global seed vault, the um, seed bank with um, Mark Dion and Amar Kanbar. But why, why I was speaking about this, um, this is in the, the lab, the quantum physics lab of Anton Zellinger, uh, was that at that time, the question of the exhibition uh, was connected with uh, issues that were investigated also through science uh, relating to what it means to be together, what it means to aggregate and what it means to move things. So the problems, the politics, let's say, the politics of the human relations and social relations were politics that went through the politics of objects. And for example, the digging of media rights and the collecting of media rights has an economy to it. And the, that was devastating a certain number of Chaco uh, indigenous populations that did not want meteor, meteors or fragments of meteors to be taken um, to different spaces for, of science or of culture in the world. And one of the projects, this is just one of many, many projects, but it was exploring um, this relationship of making an exhibition itself, of moving things and the contradictions of moving things. In the end, this would have been the largest physical object uh, on the right 
that would have ever been moved in terms of not largest, but heaviest in, in, on the planet. And ultimately after a number of meetings with the people in Chaco uh, and the artists Feivovich and Goldberg, we, they, they renunciated, they gave it up. So it's a question, it's a story of a protest. Let's call it a story of a protest that has to do with international exhibition making, but that traveled only through the negotiations around moving an object or not moving an object. And so in the end, in front of the Friedrichshanum, there was an iron, because the meteor is primarily iron of the same weight that was uh, positioned there without the actual sh shipping of this body of land, let's say. Uh, these were, well, it was, it, it was a bit of a, 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 a talk around the relationship between, um, let's say, center and periphery and the impossibility of being a center in any place. So the heart became this brain in the Friedrichanum where a number of lines or lines of flight, including the destruction of artifacts and artistic um, tools such as Etel Adnan's palette, knife for her palette, uh, connected then to a myriad of events and things happening in other parts of the world. Uh, so the focus in the brain was a little bit like the core of a, a sort of a file or folder that was a porous file or folder and, and um, connected to lives and different matters of importance. For example, Mohammed Yusuf Asefi had um, saved a number of paintings in the uh, Afghan National Museum over years in years by painting over all animals and, and human figures that were in them with watercolor, stating that he was restoring them so that they would not be then um, destroyed. And the, after the war, th th these paintings were restituted to the museum and the watercolor interventions covering over figures and objects uh, and figures and animals were, were removed. So one of them was then brought to Castle into the brain. The relationship between what went on in Castle, for example, with Michael Rakowitz's project had was a way of connecting the destruction of the books of the Middle Ages during the bombings of Germany in the war with then the destruction of the Buddhas in, in Afghanistan, where he organized this year. This is the part that people see. But what I mainly want to talk about, which is why I'm going to skip right through Pinone or the um, many things that were going on in the Awe Park. So I'm just gonna move forward for a second because we were focusing, your question was focusing on Afghanistan, I think on taking the exhibition outside as well. What I find most intriguing is the invisibility in the art world, even in the global north and global south, the invisibility of what then happened, you know, years of working in Kabul. This is something I would like to add. So I'm going to not speak about, um, I'm just, okay, this is the tree, the Penone tree in the Bagi Babur gardens that Giuseppe Penone made and donated to the, to the city of Kabul where it still lies. What, what intrigued me most after the entire project was how invisible it still is. And so I was very happy when you asked me that question. This was the building that we dedicated in C Castle to the artists who had participated in the projects in Afghanistan, but with, with a conference held. But what, what I think about a lot now is how the materials around exhibitions um, balance after time, the archival materials balance after time, what was the impression due to media or other power relations during the exhibition. So there were hundreds of uh, reviews and hundreds of discussions around the documenta, but it was always a discussion around what happened in Castle. And this is true until very recently. And only very recently, someone like yourself, Coco, poses that question of what, 
what happened there? And to me, this is astonishing. You know, it's astonishing that during the, the subsequent documenta, uh, there were arguments as to, for example, this relationship between Athens and Kessel, but that entire relationship, uh, this is the one hotel that Alighiero Boetti had organized during the um, uh, 70s and that Al Mario Garcia Torres reactivated as a space, as one of the see, see, see the seats of the of the uh, uh, exhibition in Kabul. So what is astonishing to me uh, is how invisible that exhibition still is. You know, 40,000 visitors, um, more than 50 artists, half of them Afghan, half of them non-Afghan from Goshka Machuga to, to William Kentridge. And yet the project is unknown in our world. So for example, an entire uh, 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 side of that project was the recovery and uh, digitalization and restoration of the Afghan films that had been hidden. Also, they had not been burned, they had been bit, hidden. And Afghan films was extraordinarily important and the, in, in the history of culture, uh, modern culture in, in Afghanistan until the so-called burning of the, of the films, the negatives, which actually never happened because the people who took care of Afghan films had hidden the negatives and they had given away a positives, a truckload of positives that were, that were burnt. So what you see here is just a screenshot of the result or of, of a small part of the result of uh, making um, new internegatives and working on also digitalizing much of the materials. So all of this work, which is not an exhibition, it's something that stays after the exhibition, stays forever, uh, or it doesn't stay forever, nothing stays forever, thank goodness, but all of this work done is I believe a whole, uh, something that needs to be uh, studied and established. And I'm hoping that younger students or people will want to write theses or, or do work on what created, um, for example, the shift in Francis Alice's work totally shifted after his experience there. And also Adrian Villarojas's work. Uh, so I do think that the thousands of files and thousands of photographs and thousands of documents that we have on this invisible exhibition should be a subject. I mean, why was this an invisible exhibition? Why did it remain invisible? Uh, and that uh, tells us so much about uh, the last 10 years, you know, after 2012. So I'm very much hoping that questions like yours will bring us to, um, to, to looking at the history of the of the exhibitions also in terms of what is invisible of exhibitions. And then I had some other images which I will not show you of Istanbul that also was related to digitalization and trauma around the hundred after the hundred years of since the genocide of the Armenian and it was a shifting of the geography of the Biennale, um, let's say uh, for a number of, aspects of it that had to do with Buyokada and the islands. Uh, this shifting away from the Bosphorus, which is the typical mediatized way of discussing the Istanbul Biennale to the, to the islands uh, was a metaphor of a, of a certain shift of the attention from uh, seeing Turkey as Europe, border between Europe and non-Europe, between the Christian world and the Islamic world to being something um, uh, very different, which which has to do with the undercurrents also of the digital age, because one of the themes of it was the underwater rivers and um, and what happens underwater uh, with the work done on on that not the knots. We're not going to talk about the knots. This whole work in terms of the ecosystem risks and how the underwater rivers function in relation to that around the planet and using the Bosphorus, which is one of the typical ones that scientists will be studying. But I'm going to interrupt the, the PowerPoint. And I suppose just to say that um, I agree with, it, that, that 
that I agree with Catherine that the new formats, these format that we're looking at right now, this format of me in Torino and you there and artists here and there uh, producing things and using and interacting with this new formats is of course a very, very important. It's very, very important, but I do see, um, how do you see, say a negative development going on which is an isolation and separation of knowledges as opposed to um, a kind of connect integration and elaboration of knowledges. I think that that was something that is part of the, the past. And I fear very much the alliance between on the one hand, certain tendencies, conservative tendencies in e ecological uh, programs that are uh, suggesting that we travel less for very good reasons, of course, of carbon footprint. But I see also contradictions going on in terms of producing this new labor, labor class that is not able to forge alliances because it is separated. And the carbon footprint of Zoom is, I believe, much, much higher than most uh, airplanes. Uh, that we're flying around and, and how we're going to cool all this digital stuff under the oceans and uh, is unclear to me because we're we're producing an ecological disaster by separating by 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 increasing so to such a degree the the use of the of the digital world and this ecological disaster which is unspoken is parallel to another disaster which is occurring, which has to do, I think, with essentializing, essentializations. Yes, essentializations, and which is what Catherine did, said, it's a word from a past generation. I mean, I'm 63, I'm not 53, and I'm not 43, 63. So in, in our times, we would speak about this risk of essentializations. And even the concepts of intersectionality do not, in my view, uh, go allow us to 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 uh, to really uh, move forward in in the politics that I think underpin much of the work of, of many of us so that is going to be the big challenge in 21st century big challenge for example to take out the invisibility of the documenta in in Afghanistan and discuss it with, with all its contradictions with all its contradictions, pros and cons. I mean, some people were totally against, uh, you know, I would speak with my, my counselors and, and some people were against and some people were in favor, uh, but to, to take it out of invisibility will be something important in the history of exhibition making. And then to discuss how we can uh, go back to, to spending time together. I mean, I really hope that the next Sharjah meeting will be in Sharjah and that we will not in the new normal, there won't be the impossibility for us to be together for a few days in Sharjah. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, we are uh, now less than half an hour left, but uh, Bangi, we lost you during your presentation. So I wanted to come back to you so you could finish up and then we can take some questions. We are, I'm already getting questions in the chat for from the audience. Go ahead, Bangi. You need to uh, thank yourself. I have. Hi, can you hear me? Good, good. This thing. Hello. I am trying to. Can you hear me? Bongi, we, we do hear you. Yep. Can you hear me now? Coco? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Can I just continue from, uh, because as I, as I was 
um, frozen, I was talking about uh, how, in your question, do you think it should be beneficial? The, be the benefits that we got from the two uh, biennials we, uh, are still felt even now. I mean, uh, artists uh, that participated in both the, the first and the second journey spec biennial, uh, a, the, a number of them have participated in uh, many other international uh, projects of the same nature or others, as I was indicating with Dumi, have gone on to study because of that uh, uh, kickstart of the 1995 Johannesburg Biennial. Uh, what uh, Carol, uh, Caroline was saying is something that I felt, and I, I think I've communicated to Wasan quite a number of times that uh, we are living in the in this normal. I'm not sure whether it's new or it's just this normal. That makes it so difficult for us to do uh, the, the connections to have connection, but while we know why this is happening, it's, it's maybe a challenge for us to find ways, new ways of uh, 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 innovative ways of uh, working on such projects. For example, the, the exhibitions that are online at the moment are very, very um, interesting, but because there is no person-to-person uh, -person connection, they get lost because on to the on 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 to uh, the, the the space unlike when we attend uh, these exhibitions i also It would be great. New normal is going to allow again. I'm not sure that I can hear. Coco, can you hear me? You're you're kind of going in and out. Uh, I'm not sure. I, 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 maybe maybe if you shut your camera off while you speak, that you might be able to. We might be able to get the audio more clearly. Okay, let me try that. Okay. Because uh, even with the, the the other speakers, I couldn't. The only person I could hear quite clearly was uh, uh, Octavio. All the others, maybe it's my side of uh, the network. So, oh my God. I, uh -uh. I would can you hear me? Uh, you go in and out. Uh, so I, 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 re I recommend shutting off your camera so that you can speak and be heard. Just the camera, leave the audio on. Okay, cool. I'll do that. Mm. Okay, try now. Yeah. Is it off now or no? It's not. Um, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay. I was. Uh, it, it, I think after the, the, the other presentation, it's going to be easier for me to respond to questions, if there are questions, directly um, uh, to the South African context of, with the Johannesburg Biennale in mind. Okay. Well, then, thank you, Bongi, and let's move on. Uh, the first question uh, that came up here is, how do you experience decentralization of big international events? as the process of sharing ownership and power with local art communities. So not only being organized and claimed by the big institutions, is 
is it really possible to share ownership? And I guess that that is directed at anyone who would like to answer the question. Would anyone like to respond to the question of um, decentralizing ownership? Sorry, can you repeat the question? The question? Yes, sure. It's the other says, how do you experience decentralization of big international events as a process of sharing ownership and power with local art communities? So not only being organized and claimed by the big institutions, is it really possible to share ownership? And I think that the person asking the question means, is it possible to share ownership of a major international event with local art communities? Hello, I think it happens. Uh, it has happened already, and it generally happens in any healthy biennale. I mean, I've organized, curate, been asked and competed to organize a three in my life. The Sydney Biennial, no, four. The Torino Triennale, which hasn't happened again after its second edition in 2005. Then the Sydney Biennale, the 16th Sydney Biennale, in 2008, and then the Documenta, which is not a Biennale, we've said, and then the, the um, Istanbul Biennale in 2015. And in all those cases, uh, there were not just, well, it depends on the, what you mean by the term ownership, but they were not just um, organizing institutions, which were the major in museums or institutions of the city. Uh, the Biennale of Sydney, which is an autonomous foundation, of course, was working with the MCA and the uh, Art Gallery of New South Wales, so the large museums of the city, but they were also working with many, many small community-based uh, uh, entities. Uh, and in my experience, that has happened also in Kassel, uh, for sure, and in, of course, Kabul, that's all, and, and therefore, and in Istanbul too. So I think it depends a lot um, on, on the vision that the person who's curating or drafting has in terms of connecting, of, of the function of connecting larger institutions with small local communities. And the role of the Biennale is a, is a very, how do you say, intermediary organization in general that can do that. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Of course, I know that. But but in the best cases, I I mean, not the best cases. Uh, there are many, 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 many beyond what what I've done. I think that th that that has happened. But if you mean ownership in terms of private ownership, that's different. I mean, the question of ownership. Uh, well, um, I I hope that there's a world with no. Uh, ownership at some point in in the on the planet at all uh, because I certainly think that we are I illegally owning things that belong to to trees and bees and 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 flowers and and fish and many many no other non-humans and therefore this concept of ownership is problematic I mean the term itself is for me a, a problematic term if you mean ownership as in to own something. If you mean to to participate, to 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 feel that it it uh, that it that it is urgent for for your for your life and your 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 then then if that's what ownership means, and I think that's probably what the person meant um, who asked the question, then then shared ownership. It, well, it's a psychoanalytical issue as much as it is political or uh, cultural politics. It's a psychoanalytical question. And yes, the, my answer is yes. And, and, and biennales are exactly those kind of moments where such experimentation can happen. 
Thank you. Uh, I've been asked to, uh, Catherine, Gabi, Octavio, would you like to respond to this question? Um, yes, if I may. I think also what is important is, uh, is, um, is recognizing the processes that are already in place uh, in, a, in, 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 in a situation that one uh, walks in um, and, to, and, and then you know, to kind of find um, a, a, a ground to stand on and recognizing also that this ground might be, uh, might be very shifty. Um, and, uh, and also to ensure through programming that those who did not feel welcome before, which was uh, the case, our experience with Berlin, um, feel welcome, um, you know, they feel like they are, they are part of, uh, uh, of, of, of this event. And another important um, um, uh, question also was, of course, with, uh, with the, the histories of, of institutions uh, in a city um, like, like Berlin and to kind of like force institutions to, 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 look, at, to look at themselves. Um, in relation to what that city, a city like Berlin, is known for, which is internationalism and uh, and uh, with like many immigrant groups that have been around in, in in Germany and Berlin for many 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 years, and if those people are represented in institutions, because if uh, if if those people are represented in those institutions, uh, then people have uh, a feel that they are part of uh, of. Uh, um, of, uh, of, of that institution or the events that are, that are um, uh, or, or the programs of, of that institution. I think that uh, in many instances, uh, most instances, I believe that biennials are a projection of interest, particularly related to uh, homogenic forces of the city uh, I mean by uh, I I mean by that that uh, this is probably the reason why so many biennials disappear after a couple of years or a couple of uh, instances uh, or iterations. Uh, by that I mean that uh, I see a big difference between ownership. Um, uh, participation and representation. Uh, I think that the ownership of, of most biennials are either by the foundations that create the biennials or by the city. Um, by that, in many instances, uh, the cities uh, have a specific interest in either bringing uh, some agents into the picture or censoring or displacing displacing some other interest, even if the, the biennials have uh, certain liberties to uh, through creatorship uh, uh, and certain uh, possibilities of expanding uh, ideas and um, um, projects, I think that at the same time, ownership itself only belong to those that actually fund the, uh, in a major way, uh, or receive the fundings of the participants. Uh, that happened, from what I know, in most of, of, of the biennials, in some cases in a better way than others, but uh, basically, uh, uh, even from Sao Paulo to Venice, to, Q, to Havana, etc. Uh, most of these biennials are uh, responding to in the interests of the city governments or uh, particular interest. Uh, I don't know how this will be solved in relation to uh, the way artists or institutions feel represented by a specific biennial, but there is many of the questions that Coco posted at, at the very beginning are related to all these issues. I mean, there is, uh, uh, from my perspective, a lot of political control. Uh, and even if the, the discourses that are in place are very progressive or even of great uh, opening 
to a specific cities or, or governments, still uh, there is a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, controlling agents uh, that don't allow for such, you know, uh, uh, as I understand, ownership. Uh, you can participate in many things. The case that Okoko pointed uh, when I was uh, uh, answering her question at the very beginning, uh, I think that referred directly to this issue. The, when artists organize, uh, try to organize in Cuba any specific uh, biennial, they encounter uh, a lot of difficulties and ultimate, ultimately censorship because they were so-called interfering with the interests of either the state or whoever is the one who owns the biennial. Uh, and I think that these are issues that I, uh, I think that we should bring about uh, because I don't think that there is a real independence in a biennial away from the political forces in place. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Catherine. Keith, please. I mean, I will try to bridge because you are uh, answering to your global question and uh, my uh, colleagues and friends uh, um, answers. I think that a, we have to be careful because we all know that unless you are a nominalist, Biennale is one word for many, many different realities, different sizes, different contexts, and so on and so forth. And sometimes Biennale is no more, no less than a big exhibition organized under certain circumstances and um, not necessarily uh, on a global level or even international. So again, we have to be very careful and paying attention to the many differences under the same uh, name or package this is one thing. And now I would like to go back, you know, because I, I heard very well what uh, uh, Caroline uh, wanted to say. And I think it brings me back to this notion of really paying more attention to a complex different formats. Uh, when uh, Caroline wanted to uh, discuss the um, Afghan uh, part of the documenta of her documenta project, I think that it would be better to speak in terms of project and not exhibition. Uh, you know, I'm really, really uh, always insisting on that because as soon as you say an exhibition, uh, when you think about the the story of the world, the realities, people are expecting to see things in. Uh, three-dimensional space. And I think that, you know, after Marcel Duchamp, after so many other things which happen in the meantime, we should really pay, pay attention to the one, the complexity of the aesthetical act, the complexity of the uh, reception of the uh, aesthetical act and proposal. And, and again, I go back to the moment we are living, which is, I agree, absolutely, um, not funny, not uh, it's painful, it's whatever you want, but I think it's really obliges us to pay more attention to differences, to articulations. And I wanted to bring, you know, Jeff, for not uh, making people uh, believe that I am dreaming or I'm living on the moon, I could mention a few examples, very different. Uh, one, it's not new, it's a few years ago, but I find, and I've said it and I repeat it, uh, CCA Watts programs, very, very challenging, one artist a year, and um, a very, very subtle way of uh, unlayering many aspects of an artist thinking, presence, uh, the way the artist is relating to other moments, other people, other groups, other countries, other, many others <laughs> for speaking fast. So this I found absolutely, and I learned many things, <laughs> discovered many works, many texts, many realities I ignored through this uh, uh, CCI Watts program. I would mention in a completely different um, realm, the uh, wonderful exhibition Victoria Hall in Kolkata organized on the postcards practice of Shantiniketan in India in the, in the 20s. Amazing exhibition, very poetical, very easy to access. You know, you would push on the image and the postcard would turn and you would be able to read the text. Wonderful project, a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, inviting people to look at the many layers, the many subtexts, the many contexts of the aesthetical practices in very different situations. And Shantiniketan is not, and was not, was never a museum. 
Santiniketan is a very specific uh, uh, space, which um, I mean, it's pleading for very complex um, organization and project for who is, a, who is a load, who is participating, who is inventing, who is producing and so on and so forth. And I would stop here with, because Chantiniketan is another idea and I don't want to enter in the legend and the mythification and the mystification of Chantiniketan either because I know it quite well. And third, a very contemporary example, a wonderful Chinese artist I'm working with, I just learned yesterday, so I'm a little bit <laughs> destroyed today, that his exhibition was delayed to a delay which is close to cancel. Uh, Zheng Guogu was major work in this wonderful Laos garden in the depths of uh, Guangzhou. You drive for four hours from Guangzhou. It's a, spa it's a work on um, square kilometers and square kilometers. You will never get it through one picture. You will never get it through one exhibition. You and so what do you have to do? You have to find a way of editing, of articulating visuals, uh, ideas, uh, projections, and I think the fifth, um, again, also uh, asking, and we, we again come back to a few very important points, uh, Caroline underlined, uh, the different audiences, the different attitudes, the different competence, you know, by competence, I mean, what, what do people know, what do they expect, how far are they able to um, invest, you know, because I think that uh, it, to be online, and I'm sorry to, that some people will be uh, uh, maybe um, find it uh, brutal, but you know, to be online doesn't mean you are sleeping, that doesn't mean you are like uh, swallowing, swallowing, you know, you have to pay attention, you have to push yourself, you know, it's, 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 it's travail, it's work, I go down, I would say again, and, and I think that we have to be very, um, again, to pay attention because not being, uh, obsessed with the a format, which is maybe a format much less essentialized or simplified as we think the Biennale, because again, the Biennale is one, one word for many, many uh, potentials, many possibilities. And again, not enjoying and not uh, in making everything for eternalizing the very tough moment we are living through, but you know, to invite as many people as possible to do something out of this moment. And again, I think it's really a very, uh, the, the challenge for me is to, 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 to be able to decide to invest more time, to pay more attention, to articulate more uh, precisely with, uh, to be more uh, in a way demanding until a certain extent, more confident into the aesthetical practices. You know, I'm not speaking about art because art means something a little bit uh, instrumentalized and reified these days, but the, the potential of uh, aesthetical practices, the way I would, um, I would put it. So I don't know if I am, um, I'm not at all a diplomat. So my ambition is not to federate all the ideas and all the, <laughs> the people. Uh, um, we're gonna have to, th thank you, Catherine. We, we only have three minutes left. Um, I just wanted to, in summary, because a lot of the questions that we're not going to have time to get to do have to do with a sort of tension between the local and the international, sometimes it's called the hyper-local and so on, or about the role of artists. And I just want to, to summarize that, to just note that um, uh, while I, I completely understand, you know, what uh, Octavio is saying about, you know, all biennials have these pressures, I think that in the case of certain peripheral for lack of a better term, biennials, what happens with the artist communities, with the local communities, is that they recognize that the biennial or the triennial or whatever it is, is the only time, the only occasion in which any international attention will be placed on that locale. And so the biennial becomes the focus of political and economic tension with the local art community because they have no other opportunity to have an international audience. They have no other opportunity to make direct sales. This is the case of Havana. It's the case of Dakar. It was the case of Johannesburg. I've seen it also happen in Shanghai that artists begin to project onto the international exhibition. This is our only chance and you guys are monopolizing the media and the Avail. I don't know whether anybody here can ever resolve that tension, but I do think that it's important to bring it up as the source 
Um, you know, in the case of, of Anna, one of the responses from the 90s was for artists to organize and show in their homes during the biennial to try to take advantage of that foreign presence and utilize the fact that the state had brought all those people in. And as that uh, practice developed into the present, it has become more and more of a stickler point with the state that feels that it should have total control over what can be presented to the rest of the world. So uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you to you all. We have one minute in case somebody wants to jump in and say something, but um, it's been a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you, Coco, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So good evening, good night. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Coco.